Hey everybody, Pete Meyer, Motor Age Magazine here with another edition of In the Workshop and the return of a very special guest who I'll introduce here in a moment. Um, what's he? What's we going to talk about today? Electrical testing. The probably thing most techs face with some trepidation, <laughs> to say the very least. Uh, but this gentleman has been helping techs overcome their discomfort with testing electrical systems for a long time. Uh, I'm very proud to welcome once again Mr. Vince Fischelli. Vince, how are you doing this morning? Doing great, Pete. How are you? Oh, just awesome. Just awesome. I know you've got a lot of material that we're going to try to get through, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and bring your material up here front for everyone to be able to see and share and turn it over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> this is a presentation about a, a book I wrote called Electrical Troubleshooting Shortcuts. And <clears throat> I've been training since, oh my, about 1985 I started training full time. And in those days, electrical troubleshooting was a real problem for many technicians. And today, almost 30 years, well 30 years later, it's still a problem. And as, as I go around the country and do training and people come to Dallas and attend my workshops, uh, I find that what they consider electrical troubleshooting most of the time is changing parts. And when the parts don't fix the problem, then they get frustrated and have difficulty and spend a lot of time and money uh, wasting time, a lot of vehicle downtime for fleets because of incorrect electrical troubleshooting. But, you know, today we live in a world where automotive technology is very advanced. We have CAN bus and all sorts of technologies, OBD2. And what this does is it causes a technician to focus a lot on the advanced system technologies and diagnostic systems that we have while neglecting the essential electrical troubleshooting principles relating to battery problems, cranking problems, and charging system problems. But the fact remains, if this part of the vehicle is overlooked, you can have considerable difficulties trying to repair an electrical problem because the problem relates to a battery failure of some type, which we're going to discuss, or something about the uh, cranking circuit that's not working correctly and of course the charging system which is the electrical power source for the vehicle while the vehicle is running. So problems in these areas are often overlooked or dealt with in, in a haphazard manner. So as a result of that when I started doing training in 85 I started putting in get a little handouts and I would do these sessions and as the years went by I would update the handouts and eventually got to the point where the handout got so thick and it, it left some things out that I would cover uh, verbally in the class. I decided to put together this electrical book called Shortcuts. <clears throat> and when the printer uh, looked at my first draft and he saw 250 pages, he said, You can't go any higher than 250 pages without creating a larger book and uh, binding would be a problem and, and all kinds of other issues. So I stopped the book at about 250 pages. But shortcuts is what I call it, electrical troubleshooting shortcuts, because I'm going to show you some shortcuts on how to troubleshoot battery cranking and charging problems and take into account some of the new technology that you deal with every day and show you that it's really not that difficult because shortcuts cuts through all the fuzz and get you down to the nitty-gritty on what's wrong with a particular circuit. So the book Shortcuts is what we're going to look at today and and the diagrams that I show you will be from Shortcuts and this is an outline of the book Shortcuts. It's seven sections and we're going to look at section four, five, and six we're going to do the section four first in which I show you some quick troubleshooting of battery circuits. 
and then after that we'll do section five quit troubleshooting cranking circuits and section six quit troubleshooting charging circuits and in all these examples I use some shortcuts and that's what will be presented so why is shortcuts successful teaching vehicle electrical troubleshooting because it it takes into account two important factors if you're going to troubleshoot any circuit on any vehicle I don't care if it's a, a car a pickup an SUV um, even a commercial vehicle running on a 12 volt system uh, it or a 24 volt system it the two things you need to know about the particular circuit that's giving you trouble is what are the voltages we call them circuit voltages and voltage drops these values of voltage about a circuit give you a clear picture of that part of the circuit that is that problem in the circuit that is revealed by the voltage readings and the second thing is the electron current in the circuit at different times of circuit operation when you have these two factors these two values determined and you compare them against a known good value from a good circuit then any electrical problem is easily understood and quickly repaired and what makes this so effective and helpful is all you need is a DMM and a current clamp and it's surprising sometimes when technicians realize with a DMM and a current clamp I can do all of this troubleshooting and I don't need all that expensive test equipment that's often uh, sometimes not available some of the independent shops do not have the access to very sophisticated and uh, cumbersome diagnostic machines that are used to help a technician diagnose the problem all you need is a digital multimeter and a current clamp which you see here uh, the meter on the left is um, just a basic digital multimeter nothing fancy and the current clamp on the right is absolutely essential if you don't have a current clamp you need to get one because the two together allows you to get a full picture of the voltages in a circuit and also the electron current values in order to draw a complete picture as to what's wrong with a circuit when it's not working right so let's get started let's talk about quick troubleshooting the battery circuits and this is going to help you quickly identify a battery problem with the vehicle and you know it's kind of interesting too because today on many vehicles they they go to great pains to hide the battery they might put it inside a fender uh, they'll put it back in the trunk somewhere or it'll be in the engine compartment and everything's on top of the battery so if you can troubleshoot the battery quickly and eliminate it as a source of trouble then you're way a, way ahead because the the opportunity to replace the battery and see what happens it's going to be a very time consuming process on some vehicles so if you can quick troubleshoot a battery circuit you're going to save yourself a lot of time so the first thing we're going to do about the battery is we're going to talk about battery testing as far as voltage is concerned and here's an example of where you can save yourself a lot of trouble if you simply take your digital multimeter select the 20 or 30 or 40 volt range and measure the battery OCV the open circuit voltage you're going to get a voltage reading now this voltage reading is going to tell you some things about the battery what we'd like to see is that 12.66 indicating the battery is fully charged that's nice to know if you think you've got a bad battery on a vehicle that it has a state of charge of 12.66 which correlates to a full state of charge 100 percent state of charge now you can see that as the state of charge of the battery goes down the OCV reading goes down so you can use this chart which is on 
uh, included in shortcuts and, and look at the voltage and see what the state of charge is of the battery. For example, if you've got a car that's been in your shop for several days and it's just been sitting there while you're waiting for parts or you're, you're doing a major repair, that battery is sitting there and it's slowly discharging. It, it just happens. And so if you don't recognize that, when you complete the repair and you try to start the engine, you discover the battery is dead. Well, then you jump start the, the vehicle and the car is returned to the customer. Uh, what happens when he gets home or within a day or so, he ends up with a, uh, a no crank situation. He has the car towed back to your shop and <clears throat> you, you, Diagnose the problem as a defective battery, it's bad, and you call him back and say, well, you've got a bad battery, and he says to you, well, my battery was fine until you worked on my car. Well, you know, the man's got uh, a good point. Uh, what happened to the battery while it was in the shop is it just self-discharged to the point that it will not charge back up again. Now, some batteries, and I'm not going to mention any particular brand, but I can tell you that a, a seal top battery, many times if it's discharged, has a very difficult time being recharged and sometimes won't do so. So you don't want your battery in the car to go down very far in terms of its OCV reading indicating the battery's going down. What you can do when you see the battery drop down to 12.58, that's 90% state of charge, which tells you 10% of the battery's charge has been lost just with the vehicle sitting there in the service bay. So what you need to do is take a small trickle charger, put it on the battery terminals, and let that charge eight hours a day. Turn it off at night when you go home. Don't leave it on when you're not in the shop. And, and keep that battery charged up. And every day in the morning when you first get there, you can check the OCV, and if you got your 12.6 down to maybe 12.58, uh, no harm has been done. You can charge the battery back up and keep it fully charged, and you'll never have a customer come back to you and say, since you worked on my car, now I've got a dead battery, and, and want you to replace the battery at no charge. It's happened too many times over the years. When I started training full-time, uh, my first client was Interstate Battery, and I wrote the uh, Interstate Battery Electrical Clinic that was uh, being used back in late 80s and all through the 90s, and I traveled all over the country uh, doing these electrical clinics at night. And as a result of that experience, a lot of times people would raise their hand in the class and would ask me a question. And sometimes I didn't have an answer. I'd have to come back and research and look into it and uh, design, uh, decide what, what to do to solve the problem. And one of the things that was always asked, why is it after I work on a customer's car and I give him back the car, a couple of days later, he says, the battery's dead and I owe him a battery that I damaged his battery. And that's the simple answer. Watch the OCV. When it drops below 12.58, you need to get a trickle charger and keep it on for the, for the four to eight hours and keep that battery fully charged. You'll never have a customer come back and say, you owe me a battery because you worked on my car. Now, another thing that we learn about OCV, you'll see there's a few numbers there along above the chart. The first number is 10.55. Now, what does that mean? Well, here's the situation. When you uh, <clears throat> have a battery failure and what occurs inside the battery is one of the cells is becomes shorted. What happens is the plate material flakes off. It builds up in the bottom of the cell. And when it reaches a high enough level, it will short the positive and the negative plates in that one cell and you'll lose 2.11 volts. Now this can happen at any moment, at any time. You could stop at a grocery store or you could be in a gas station 
and you're filling up your car. You turn the key off, you get out, you fill up your tank, you get back in the seat, turn on the key, and all you hear is a click. You don't hear that engine rolling over. Well, you, you ask, uh, the, the customer is going to think, wow, what happened to my battery? And he'll go to somebody and say, you got a set of jumper cables and help me jump my car off. And then the Good Samaritan says, be glad to help you. And they pull the car up to the car with the dead battery. They hook up the jumper cables. And guess what? You can't jump start the car because it has a shortest cell battery. When you have shortest cell battery, you're going to see something around 10.5 volts. That's an immediate giveaway. One cell is shorted. Forget about jump starting, it just won't work. And I've had many people tell me in those interstate battery clinics, you know, uh, we tried to jump start this customer's car and we couldn't jump start it. Well, did you check the battery OCV? No, I didn't do that. Well, you need to do that. You'll find 10.55 volts. It's got a shorted cell. The battery needs to be replaced. It's not reliable and you can't jump start it. Okay, now the other thing that can happen to a battery is <clears throat> this gentleman is in the driveway pumping his gas. He's finished, gets back in the car, turns on the key, and he hears click. Well, okay, my battery's not going to start. He goes and finds this fellow, that uh, Good Samaritan, has got some jumper cables and is willing to help him jump start his car. So he pulls his car around to the car with the dead battery puts the jumper cables on the guy's uh, battery terminals, and the driver starts the engine, boom, starts up right away. So they remove the jumper cables, and the uh, individual drives away, very happy. He got his car started. He goes home, uh, parks the car in the driveway. The next morning, he goes out to his truck or his car to go to work, puts a key in the ignition, and he hears click. Well, <clears throat> again, something's happened inside the battery. Now, we just talked about a shorted cell. Well, the other thing that can happen to the battery is an open cell. And that means one of the straps or one of the plates inside the battery has physically come loose, and you now have an open circuit in the battery. If you put the voltmeter across the battery terminals and you see basically no voltage, we're looking at here about a half a volt, that's a dead giveaway that the battery has developed an open cell. Now the problem with this issue is that you can jump start this vehicle and it will jump start right away. But the problem is you're now driving the vehicle as if there is no battery connected in the vehicle. Even though it's physically there because it has an open circuit, it is useless. Well, what do you think happens to uh, all the electronic system on the vehicle when the battery is disconnected. Well, the generator gets very upset and often will increase the charging voltage to an alarming rate. We've had reports of um, charging systems cranking out over 30 volts when the battery is disconnected. And driving around that way, you're going to severely damage all the electronics on the vehicle. So you don't want to jump start any vehicle until you measure OCV. If you see 10 and a half volts, you got a shorted cell. If you see about a half a volt, you have an open cell, you better not jump start. And that's the simple fact. And the simple process of measuring battery open circuit voltage is clearly going to show you the condition of the battery. And then there's one other voltage reading where you might be checking a battery's OCV as part of your uh, uh, electrical diagnosis, uh, even using our flip chart first things first. It's, a, it's the first step. You measure battery OCV. In this case, you read over 13 volts. Now, it goes without saying that, so I better say it, that when you are checking OCV, you can't just turn the key off and check OCV and see the battery state of charge. You can see if you have a shorted cell with 10.5 volts or an open cell with 0.5 volts. 
but as far as the battery chemistry is concerned, it needs a, an hour or so to calm down chemically to give you a valid open circuit voltage test. So if you're going to check OCV to determine state of charge, just as a courtesy to your customer, you need the battery to sit there for about an hour and calm down and cool off a little bit, and then you can get the OCB reading. So let's say that you let the car sit there for a couple of hours in the shop, and you're going to do a battery OCB test, and you put the meter across the battery terminals, and you see over 13 volts. Well, the batteries have time to calm down. It should be reading somewhere around 12.6 maybe as high as 12.8, which would be normal surface charge on some uh, maintenance-free batteries, but you're reading 13 volts. Well, that's telling you that the battery has lost some of the water, the H2O, in the battery, and that's due to the battery being charged too much and gassing and uh, losing some of the water. So you could pop the caps on this battery and add distilled water. You never add tap water or bottled water. No way. Only distilled water. You can get a jug of distilled water at any supermarket for a dollar. You keep that in the shop for topping off batteries. So you use an eyedropper uh, to carefully insert distilled water in each battery cell and get the uh, water level back up to the bottom of the vent wells. But here's one thing you got to look for. When you pop the caps and look inside each individual cell, if the plate material has been exposed to air and dried out, don't add any water because I guarantee you the next day you're going to have a dead battery because that plate material that's been exposed to air and has dried out has become inert. You just put the caps back on the battery and you inform the customer your battery is low on water. I can't add water because it will cause the remaining electrolyte to thin out again to the normal level and with less plate material active in the uh, electrolyte you're not going to get enough energy to crank the engine in a day or two. So I've even had people tell me in these electrical clinics, they'd raise their hand and say, well, how come every time I add water to a battery? The next day or two, the customer calls me up and says, he's got a dead battery, and I need to put a battery in his car because his battery was fine until I added the water. Well, that's the answer. If plate material is exposed to air, you don't add water. You just inform the customer the battery is not going to last much longer. You can change it now, or here's my business card. My record will pick you up in a week or two or a month, and then we'll put a battery in it so you can save yourself a service call by having your battery replaced now. So it's up to you. But you see, we can learn so much by just checking battery voltage, which we call OC, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> OCV, or some people call it state of charge. And if the battery is fully charged, you're good to go, and you know the battery voltage is where it's supposed to be. Uh, a couple of times we've checked OCV and found the, the OCV reading would be around 12.45, 12.35. We would ask the customer, what's, what's your driving habits? And sometimes you'll discover that people don't drive their car very much. When they do drive it, they take short trips. And so the battery is never able to fully be recharged by a long drive cycle. And that indicates a low state of charge, and there's not much you can do for a customer like that except tell them to get out more often and drive the car a little bit more and, and keep that battery fully charged. So you see, we can learn a lot just by checking OCV. It explains a lot of things about battery problems that many technicians deal with every day and don't understand. So one simple test can surely give you a lot of information about the battery's condition, when to jump start, when not to jump start, 
and what to do if you got over 13 volts and it's low on water. So all that's included in in the chapter four, section four of shortcuts. It's in there with uh, plenty of explanation and details to to help you fully understand. A simple test like this can help you with so many different things. So that takes care of the battery voltage. I know I'm not done yet. I've got something later for battery voltage, but let's stay with the battery for right now. Because the next thing I need to know about my battery is the electron current. Now this is new to some of you, I know, because when I present this in the workshops, people look at me and say, I never heard this before. And when I teach it in uh, uh, various fleet operations when I go out and do training for fleets and we get all the technicians around the vehicle and we run this test the, they're, they're amazed that they never knew this before but when you talk about the electron current of a battery I'm not talking about the battery discharging that's a separate issue we're going to cover that a little bit later right now what I'm concerned about is how this battery charges now what you're looking at here in, the, in this illustration, you see the battery connected to the generator, and yeah, that generator's humming, so the engine's running, and <clears throat> we know that the generator is the guy that controls the electrical system when the engine is running. The battery is not doing any uh, energy supplying to the vehicle. In fact, the battery becomes a load on the generator when the engine is running. That means that battery current is going to enter the battery negative cable, flow through the battery, and return back to the B plus terminal on the back of the generator. So there's we call that battery recharge electron current. You measure that with a current clamp and you see the current clamp there. This is one of the reasons you need to have a current clamp. You can't do this test without a current clamp. So get yourself a current clamp if you don't have one. And keep it handy because it's going to come in uh, play a lot of places as we go through this training. I have the current clamp on the battery cable and I'm monitoring the electron current that's recharging the battery. Looking at the voltmeter, that confuses people sometimes because the current clamp is developing a voltage as it senses the electron current flowing through the battery cable inside the jaws. And so we read the voltage from the current clamp and that translates into amps. The voltmeter says 0 .008. That means that the battery right now is drawing eight amps off the generator. Well, <clears throat> this electron current that goes through the battery is a function of the battery's internal resistance. Now you can't measure internal resistance of a battery with an ohmmeter because it's a voltage source. But if I look at the electron current flowing into the battery, I'm going to see how much current is flowing through that battery. And here's what I can tell you from having done this a number of years, so ever since I started doing training, and I got a, a glimpse of this issue. It was something I didn't find in any book. It was something that came up when technicians would say, how come I, I put three, batter, uh, three generators on this car and they only last about a week? And <clears throat> I don't know where else to go, what else to do. And so <clears throat> what we're talking about here is the battery is drawing too much recharge current. Well, how can we tell without checking the current using a current clamp? And <clears throat> what I'm going to say is simply this. Most batteries, after they've been charging, in other words, the engine <clears throat> has been idling, that this current, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> this current should drop below 10 amps in five minutes of engine idle. So you put a current clamp on the uh, cable, you start the engine, 
Now, the first reading you're going to see on the meter is going to be the cranking amps. I don't want that number. I'm not testing for cranking amps now. What I'm testing for is battery recharge current. So then once the engine begins to run and the generator is producing charging voltage and producing the energy to recharge the battery, the first burst of electron current that enters the battery is called recharge current and it's going to it's called the inrush recharge current and that reading should could be as high as 40 50 60 amps but it quickly comes down drops down as the engine idles and you watch it come down and most batteries over the course of the last 30 years that I've been running these tests if it drops down below 10 amps then I know the battery is okay some batteries internally do not build up their resistance and they continue to draw that 40, 50 amps continuously. Well, that puts a strain on the generator. So here comes a car in the shop and you diagnose it and determine the generator is bad. So you call the customer and tell them your generator is bad, going to have to replace the generator, going to cost you so much, and the customer says, okay. You replace the generator and everything seems to be fine. You send the customer back the car and a few days later he's back in the shop and his generator has failed again. Well you say well that just probably was a bad generator from stock so I'll I'll replace it a second time and guess what? He comes back again with another dead generator. Well it's the battery the battery is drawing too much current. I've seen 28 amps in a battery all the time. In other words, I do the recharge electron current test and I see 28 amps. It doesn't go down. It stays solid, 28 amps. Smoke a generator in three days, just driving around town. And they put three generators on this car. We checked the current draw and had 28 amps, replaced the battery, the recharge current went up to 25, 30 amps and quickly came down to about 6 amps. That generator was fine. So you have to do this test anytime you have a generator failure because it could have been the battery drawing too much current off the generator that burned up the diodes in the generator. Vince, let me interrupt you for one second here. I want a clarification on this. So the battery itself could pass normal load tests uh, and OCV tests, but still have an issue that would cause the generator to overwork itself. Is that correct? That is correct. And okay. this is explained in shortcuts in a lot of detail, but I'm glad you mentioned that because <clears throat> what happens inside the battery, when you do a, a carbon pile load test, you're testing what comes out of the battery. And it may do just fine. It may crank the engine just fine because the current can come out and supply the current through the starter motor, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes in the next session. But I'm testing what's going into the battery. That is a separate test all by itself. And some batteries will pull too much current off the generator and cause the diodes in the generator to fail. And I've got to ask one other question. I know some of these generators, you know, we used to test them for maximum output. Um, it's 100, 120 amps. Uh, so you're saying that even if these are pulling over 10 amps during length of time, that, that's, that's not healthy for the generator? Well, this, this current reading that we're looking at here in the illustration with 8 amps, that's a constant draw of this battery on the generator. Now the generators designed in in the the engineers get uh, consider that the battery is going to pull a few a few amps off the generator, so they calculate that into their overall rating. And and as long as that current through the battery is low, I don't have to worry about the battery. But when a generator fails, and I don't check the battery to see what the recharge current is. If the battery caused the generator failure in the first place and I just changed the generator, 
uh, I'm going to have that car back in the shop for another generator in just a few days. I had one example. Uh, this is a classic story, and I, it won't take but a second to share, but uh, I was doing a class down in Florida, and a guy walks in on Monday morning, and he says, uh, can I ask you a question before the class starts? And I said, sure, and I was setting stuff up so I, I could chat. And He said, I've got a 88 Mercury marquee, and he said, I put three generators on this car. Now, I'm a shop owner, and you know, it's just annoying to have to have my techs replace my generator. And as soon as I heard that, I said, wow, let, let, let's stop. Where's your car? Well, it happened to be right outside the meeting room. So we went out with the current clamp. I put it on the, ca on, on the negative cable. He started the engine, and he had 52 amps. And the back of the generator was so hot, you couldn't. It was hotter than the manifold. So I said, shut it off, shut it off. And he shut it off, and, and I said, when you get back to your shop tonight, he said, well, I'm going home. I'm not going back to the shop. I said, you call your shop and tell them to wait for you and put a new battery in your car because that's what's burning up your generator. So he did. He came in on Tuesday morning and sat down. I said, well, did you change the battery? He said, yeah, I did. Well, let's go check it. So we took the current clamp. He started it up. And within about 30 seconds, the current dropped down to 6 amps. And you could put your hand on the back of the generator. It wasn't hot at all. So, so, so I guess that's what we're saying is that the, if you have an app or alternator straight to the current rating, that's, that's what it's designed to put out on peak demand, on those occasions when there might be peak demand. But it's not designed to run that hard or even half that hard for any long length of time. Right, okay. like a lot of like a lot of the components on today's cars, and I would even think that, and, and correct me from your experience, using the old style, you know, load the alternator up testing uh, when you're doing a, a standard charging system test could actually, you know, lead to damage to the alternator uh, on some of these newer vehicles. Well, no question. In fact, uh, this comes up a lot when I'm doing fleet training because many technicians have been taught you place a carbon pile on the battery terminals with the engine running and then you crank the carbon pile to see how many amps you can pull off the generator. Now that's insane. That's totally wrong but it's been done for so long that most people think that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. And it's wrong. Uh, a generator <clears throat> will never put out its maximum current. In fact most generators are designed so that their normal current draw running the vehicle will be about, let's say, on the average, 50 amps. Well, then that generator will be designed to be a 100-amp generator. Sure. So it, it, it's going to operate at half of its rated output. If you stress that generator with a carbon pile to see how many amps you can pull off the generator and say it's a 105-amp alternator, and you can get 100 amps off of it, well, you could look around and smile at your buddy and say, that's putting out 100 amps. But you're putting that generator in jeopardy of burning up its diodes. It should never be done that way. But it's so common in our industry. People do it and teach it all the time. Mm -hmm. And I encourage people to stop it. In fact, I have the standing order in my workshop. If I ever see you do that when we're doing the hands-on on the vehicles out in the shop, you're going to give me 50 push-ups. <laughs> I use push-ups as penalties for doing things the wrong way. <laughs> it's done in fun. Everybody laughs, and nobody would dare pick up a carbon pile and put a current load on a generator. That's not the way to test a generator. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. I'm going to give you some shortcuts on testing a generator circuit. Awesome. You bet. Well, so what have we done so far? Well, we've looked at battery voltage, the OCB test, and now we're discovering how a battery can be determined to burn up a generator. If, but, of course, if you don't have a current clamp, you can't do the test. So these simple tests don't take a lot of time, and all you need is a voltmeter and a current clamp. Can't be any simpler than that. All right, Pete, that uh, covers the battery testing. I'm looking here at uh, 
the next step my my screen is frozen I can't seem to okay let's see what happened okay yeah this something happened there for a second I got it squared away yes yeah, so we've done battery testing for voltage and battery testing for electron current and I hope everybody learned uh, understands that putting a carbon pile on the battery terminals and seeing if the generator puts out its maximum current rating is the wrong thing to do and they'll never do it again because every time you do it you're going to owe me 50 push-ups. 